Welcome to the podcast, Crime Salad, where we talk true crime. I'm your host, Ashley, and with me always is my husband and partner in crime, Ricky. The purpose of this podcast is to honor the victims through ethical storytelling in the hopes of preventing future tragedies. We want our stories to resonate and educate others in hopes that some of these similar cases with identifiable patterns can be prevented. Now, before we jump in, please let us warn you that this is a true crime podcast. The details of this episode may be triggering to some listeners. Listener discretion advised. On the morning of June 2, 2018, Chef Daniel Brophy arrived early at the Oregon Culinary Institute. He liked to get there early to set up his classroom for his students. He was there filling the ice buckets and water buckets before his students arrived that day, getting their individual cooking stations ready for a full day of learning. While he was facing the sink, an intruder came up behind him and shot him in the back, piercing his lung and his heart. The shot was instantly fatal. However, his killer wanted to ensure he wouldn't survive. As he lay dying on the ground, staring up at the ceiling, his killer bent over him and shot him a second time, point blank in the heart. Then his killer fled the scene, and within minutes, his students began to arrive. One student found him unconscious on the ground and began performing CPR, while another called 911. However, there was no saving the friendly, likable chef. By the time the paramedics arrived, his workplace was declared a crime scene. There were two 9mm shell casings found at the scene. Later, law enforcement was unable to find any identifiable prints or touch DNA on the fired shell casings, leading investigators to believe that this was a targeted murder and that the killer likely wore gloves. A work colleague and a friend of the Brophy's called Dan's wife, Nancy Brophy, to let her know that her husband had been hurt and possibly killed at work. She was asked if Nancy wanted to go down to his workplace. Nancy allegedly said that they were probably busy and there was probably a lot of police tape. Eventually, she did finally go down to the crime scene at 10.30 a.m. And once she arrived, police informed Nancy that her husband had been murdered. Nancy didn't seem upset, but did seem to want to talk and chat. In fact, she was relentless in making continuous small talk. Everyone processes grief differently, so the police weren't sure if she was still in shock. Now, the next day, Nancy informed family and friends of Dan's death via a Facebook post. It read, quote, For Facebook friends and family, I have sad news to relate. My husband and best friend, Chef Dan Brophy, was killed yesterday morning. For those of you who are close to me and feel this deserved a phone call, you are right, but I'm struggling to make sense of everything right now. There is a candlelight vigil at Oregon Culinary Institute tomorrow, Monday, June 4th at 7 p.m. While I appreciate all of your loving responses, I am overwhelmed. Please save phone calls for a few days until I can function, end quote. Nancy Crampton Brophy was born on June 16, 1950 in Wichita Falls, Texas. She was the daughter of two lawyers and had one brother. She moved to Houston for college, graduating from the University of Houston with a degree in economics. Shortly after graduating, she married her first husband, who was a police officer. That marriage was short-lived and didn't produce any children. After her divorce, Nancy, an extrovert, wanted a new life filled with new experiences and adventure. She decided to move to the Oregon coast in the early 1990s. Shortly after arriving in Oregon, she met Dan Brophy, and she met him when she attended the Lee Cordon Bleu College of Culinary Arts in Portland, Oregon. Daniel Craig Brophy, who went by Dan to his family and friends, was born on June 27, 1954. He was born and raised in North Dakota before moving to the Oregon coast. Dan was the instructor for Nancy's very first class at culinary school. 
Students of his said that he could be very tough at first and held all of his students to a very high standard. However, he was also friendly and witty and became friends with many of his students. One of the things that stood out the most about Dan Brophy was his expertise with all things mushrooms. He would often take his students out to his favorite foraging spots and taught them how to find and identify the best truffles and mushrooms. Dan also ran a side business where he sold his homegrown herbs and mushrooms at the Institute. Dan also occasionally worked as an instructor on how to humanely slaughter and process chickens. Nancy, who was almost five years older than her married instructor, took an immediate liking to Dan. The two became close friends over the next four years. Once he left his wife and son from that marriage, Nancy pursued him hard and eventually won the affection of the object of her desire. Friends and family attended their large marriage ceremony in 1999, assuming the couple were legally married. They even referred to each other as husband and wife. However, their marriage only became official on June 14, 2016, when they finally filed the paperwork with the Washington County Clerk's Office. At the time of Dan's murder, the couple had been together in a total for almost 25 years. When they were first married, Dan remained a culinary instructor, earning between $50,000 and $60,000 per year. However, he and Nancy also ran a catering business for 10 years, which at one time had over 25 employees and grossed $500,000 a year in annual revenue. Their catering business began slowing down after 9-11, eventually forcing them to cut the number of their staff in half. They closed the business for good in 2006 after the economy crashed. Nancy gave an interview to the Oregonian at the time where she said, quote, If you laid off 40 people this year, you're not thinking, let's have a holiday party. You're thinking, nobody is in the mood to celebrate. That's when Nancy, a budding romantic suspense author, began selling Medicare and life insurance policies. Now, selling insurance was how Nancy supported herself. However, her love for creative fiction writing was always her first love. In fact, immediately after Nancy graduated from college, she dabbled in technical and business writing. It wasn't until 2013 that she began pursuing her love of writing fictional romantic suspense. Her writing became so prolific that Nancy eventually self-published a five-book series called The Wrong Series, and included titles such as The Wrong Brother, The Wrong Seal, The Wrong Lover, and The Wrong Husband. Dan's mother, Karen Brophy, would tell law enforcement that Dan and Nancy seemed happy together. She noticed that recently the two were beginning to talk about retirement and selling their home. At first, they had looked in rezoning their own property and selling off some of their land. Unfortunately, the more they researched that option, they discovered that it wasn't a viable option. The cost of rezoning coupled with real estate fees meant that they were better off selling their home outright. At the time of Dan's murder, the couple had about $320,000 in equity in their home. That is when the couple began looking at other properties to purchase. And Dan seemed particularly interested in selling their home and purchasing a smaller plot of land outside of Portland for Dan's famous garden and his beloved chickens. Karen Rofi told authorities that Dan could have easily been content not selling their home and instead staying closer to family. Unfortunately for Dan, Nancy had something more adventurous in mind. She wanted to sell all of their worldly possessions and buy something in either Spain or Portugal and spend the rest of their days traveling throughout Europe. Well, from a review of their finances, it appeared that Nancy's dreams of funding a retirement in Europe were bigger than her retirement funds would allow, which, according to a forensics audit, were practically non-existent. In fact, at the time of Dan's murder, the couple was often behind on their mortgage payments. Yet, Nancy made sure that they were never behind on their life insurance payments, of which there would turn out to be many. When law enforcement asked Nancy about their finances, she insisted that things were better than ever. But that clearly wasn't true. In fact, six months before Dan's murder, they had taken out a $35,000 loan from Dan's 401k retirement account. And this was about 50% of the total funds in his retirement account. And they used this money to pay off their debt and catch up on their mortgage. 
Despite these dire circumstances, Nancy had a positive spin on their finances. When police asked about life insurance, Nancy played dumb and said that she thought Dan had a small work policy and she personally had a $40,000 life insurance policy on Dan. Later, police would discover that Dan Brophy was worth $1.5 million after he died. But it would be closer to $1.8 million when you factored in that Nancy no longer had to share the equity in their home. When police asked Nancy about her whereabouts that day, she told them that she was in bed as usual and didn't leave the house until around 10.15 a.m. to go down to the Culinary Institute to check on Dan. And when police asked to photograph her Toyota Sienna minivan, she asked them if they thought that she was involved and objected to the photographs. She told the officers that she wasn't near that crime scene that morning and that taking the photographs was unnecessary. It's easy to see why Nancy initially became the prime focus of the investigation. Within just 30 days of Dan's murder, Nancy called the lead detective on the case and she asked for a favor. In her usual chatty and flirty manner, she asked the officer to write her a letter stating that she was no longer a suspect in her husband's murder. And she did this so that she could collect on the $40,000 life insurance policy. And the officer's response, well, he laughed before he declined her request. They believe that was Nancy's way of trying to find out if police suspected her of Dan's murder. Of course, like any spouse of a murder victim, she was the number one suspect. One of the first questions they asked Nancy is if she owned a gun, which she did. Six months before Dan's murder, she went to a Portland area gun show and paid a little over $600 for a 9mm Glock handgun. This is the same type of gun that police had determined was used in Dan's murder. However, when it was checked by the crime lab, it turned out to be not the weapon used in Dan's murder. But there was something interesting about this gun. The barrel slide appeared to have been installed incorrectly. It had law enforcement wondering if perhaps the slide chamber and the barrel had been replaced. That is when they discovered that less than a week after Nancy purchased the Glock, she purchased a replacement slide and barrel from an online eBay auction for $365. But even more interesting was the fact that a few months prior to her purchase of the Glock, Nancy purchased a ghost gun kit from ghostgun.com, a site she stated she found from a New York Times article. But Nancy had an innocent explanation for these purchases. After the Parkland school shooting in Florida, Nancy became obsessed with personal safety. She alleged that Dan agreed that she should purchase a gun for their safety. Now, this is in stark contrast to Dan's lifelong objection to guns. In fact, when Nancy was married to her first husband, a police officer in Houston, one of their issues was that Nancy refused to allow him to keep his personal gun collection in their home. Now, despite these inconvenient facts, Nancy insisted that Dan give her $400 cash, which she matched with another $400 to attend the gun show and purchase the Glock. Nancy alleged that she was concerned for Dan's safety and wanted him to have a gun with him while he foraged for mushrooms. She insisted that some of the mushroom hunters were territorial about their foraging spots because the mushrooms were often worth a lot of money. Once the gun arrived, Dan changed his mind and was no longer willing to carry a gun with him for safety. But that still doesn't explain why she purchased a ghost gun kit a few weeks before she purchased the Glock. Nancy, who was never at a loss for words, explained that she purchased the ghost gun kit as a writing tool. Now, a ghost gun kit is an untraceable and unregistered homemade weapon that can be made with a 3D printer or assembled from a kit into a 9mm Glock. These kits are unregulated by the government, and they're widely available, and they can be purchased by anyone. Nancy would later explain that she purchased the writing tool for an additional $675 prior to the purchase of the gun to help in the development of one of her books. And she explained that Dan was fully aware of her purchase, despite their dire financial condition, and got a, quote, hoot out of her antics. She would later explain to a jury that she had purchased handcuffs, night vision goggles, and high-powered binoculars in pursuit of her literary endeavors. She told the jury that she had an idea for a book that involved a female who was being stalked. 
She intended for her character to purchase parts of a gun over the internet to eventually turn it into a gun to protect herself. However, she said after watching several YouTube videos, she discovered that the kit would be impossible to assemble by herself. She was expecting something a little more on the lines of a Lego set, and instead got something that required a drill press and other tools that she didn't own or know how to use. When she explained why she purchased the additional slide and barrel, she said it's because she was obsessed with the gun parts and was, quote, amazed at how obsessed I became. Nancy told the jury that she often gets lost in her characters when planning a new book. After discovering this, law enforcement became a little more interested in Nancy's books. They discovered that in addition to the nine books that she self-published, she had also penned a very curious-sounding essay in November of 2011. The essay was entitled, How to Murder Your Husband. It was done in a tongue-in-cheek style with Nancy's signature sarcasm. The essay highlighted several ways of killing your husband and suggested that the only crime worth committing was a crime that could never be solved. We're going to share portions of it with you. It begins with the quote, As a romantic suspense writer, I spend a lot of time thinking about murder and consequently police procedure. After all, if murder is supposed to set me free, I certainly don't want to spend any time in jail. And let me say clearly for the record, I don't like jumpsuits and orange isn't my color. Motives. Financial. This is big. Divorce is expensive, and do you really want to split your possessions? Or if you married for money, aren't you entitled to all of it? The drawback is the police aren't stupid. They're going to look at you first. So you have to be organized, ruthless, and very clever. Husbands have disappeared from cruise ships before. Why not yours? Lying, cheating bastard, deception of any sort. This is a crime of passion. In anger, you bash his head in or stab him with a kitchen knife. Most of the time, there's a trail that leads directly to you. Each type of murder leads clues. A crime of passion does not look like a stranger was involved. And who's left to clean up the blood from your carpet? Fall in love with someone else. Usually finances are also involved here. Let's say your church frowns on divorce. You need to be a widow so you don't fall out of favor with your religion. At this point, I should mention that it also helps if you aren't too burdened by the Ten Commandments. Abuser. This one's tough. Anyone can claim abuse. What is abuse? To a teenager, it might look different than to a spouse. As a motivation, this reason usually comes up after you've been arrested. Not a lot of abused wives dial 911 burning down the house with their husbands in it. It's your profession. Now we're talking. You have the moral ambiguity necessary to carry it off, quick hit, and you fade from the scene. Get your payment up front from somebody else because life insurance probably won't send a check. Options to consider. Guns, loud, messy, and require some skill. If it takes 10 shots for the sucker to die, either you have terrible aim or he's on drugs. Knives, really personal, close up, blood everywhere, ew. Garrote, how much upper body strength does it require to strangle a person? A random heavy piece of equipment. Usually this involves hitting someone hard with the baseball bat or the pipe wrench you happen to have in your hand. Poison. Considered a woman's weapon, arsenic is easy to obtain. Worse, it's easy to trace. It takes a month or two to kill someone. Plus, they're sick the entire time, and who wants to hang out with a sick husband? Knowledge of pharmaceuticals would be handy. Availability would be even better. A word of caution, watch out for poisons found in nature. They're not a sure thing, too little, too much. Your mother always told you to marry a doctor. Now you know why. Hiring a hitman. Do you know a hitman? Neither do I. And an amazing number of hitmen rat you out to the police or blackmail you later. I find it easier to wish people dead than to actually kill them. I don't want to worry about blood and brains splattered on my walls, and really, I'm not good at remembering lies. But the thing I know about murder is that every one of us has it in him or her when they're pushed far enough. What constitutes good romantic suspense is the wise. What happened that forced the person into this situation? How will they justify this action? 
By the way, he needed killing is not a legal defense. A confidence whispered in the dark is no longer a secret. What if killing didn't produce the right results? Would they do it again? Could they do it again? What if they liked it? Whoa, there's an idea for a new story. You can see why police would find Nancy's article interesting, if not blatant, foreshadowing by an overly dramatic suspense author. And it honestly sounds like these were her thoughts written in a personal journal. Law enforcement believed Nancy's motive for killing Dan was financial, which was one of the motives she perfectly described in her essay. Nancy had also bookmarked an article entitled 10 Ways to Get Away with Murder. Once police viewed video evidence that Nancy was driving around the crime scene in circles at the time of Dan's murder, they believed they had enough to finally arrest her. And when they did arrest her, she seemed shocked and stated, you must think I murdered my husband. To which they replied that they were very sure. Due to COVID, Nancy's trial didn't begin until April 4th, 2022. And at trial, the prosecutor stated, quote, Dan Brophy was content in his simplistic lifestyle, but Nancy Brophy wanted something more. The bottom line is Dan Brophy was worth almost $1.5 million to Nancy Brophy if he was dead, and he was worth a lifetime of financial hardship if he stayed alive. Nancy Brophy planned and carried out what she believed was the perfect murder, a murder that she believed would set her from the grips of financial despair and enter a life of financial security and adventure, end quote. At trial, Nancy's defense centered around a homeless man who would often sleep outside the Culinary Institute. Police dismissed this theory early because Dan wasn't robbed and nothing was missing. The prosecutor put up a floor plan for the Culinary Institute and showed clearly that Dan's classroom was located in the back of the facility and it was very difficult to get to unless you knew exactly where you were going. The prosecutor also showed the jury a video from the day of the shooting and it showed Nancy in her van driving around the facility at 7.08 a.m. and again at 7.28 a.m. when she finally left the area. Nancy clearly lied to investigators about her whereabouts that day. She had an expert witness testify that Nancy was so shocked after learning of Dan's death that she developed retrograde amnesia that caused her to forget the details of that morning. Later, she would say that she was probably running on autopilot and went to get a coffee from Starbucks and was just aimlessly driving around working out plot points for her next suspense novel, something she said she did often. On cross-examination, Nancy admitted that she must have been the person driving around the crime scene at the time of Dan's murder. However, she said she knew that she wasn't responsible for his murder because of how she felt in her heart. She said that this was the best time in their lives, and they both were still happy in love with each other. Now, Nancy had no explanation for why police were unable to locate her ghost gun kit or the extra slide and gun barrel for her Glock. The prosecution believes this proves that Nancy disposed of them since they were used in Dan's murder. Dan had an adult son named Nathaniel Stillwater, and he testified against Nancy. He told the jury that he was initially estranged from his father once he began dating and then married Nancy. He said that he had reconnected with his father once he turned 21, and the two had become closer ever since. Nathaniel testified that after Dan's murder, he offered to loan Nancy money. However, he said that she declined his offer and had gone from someone who was always concerned about money to someone not worrying about money at all. He also testified that Nancy never informed him that his father had been murdered. Instead, he was told by his grandmother, something he testified will forever be seared in his mind. A computer expert testified that Nancy had made several incriminating searches from her computer, including ghostguns.com, kickback with a Glock, gun shops in Portland, when do you have to register a gun in Oregon, gun safety classes, Glock 17 slide, how to sell a gun in Oregon, how to load a Glock, and how to clean a Glock. Numerous witnesses testified that while Nancy wore the pants in the relationship, the couple got along well and had an ideal relationship based on mutual love and compromise. Some even described their relationship as idyllic. 
Nancy's defense also called several of her writer friends as witnesses. Several of the witnesses testified that Nancy had told them about her ghost gun purchase and that they knew that she was using it for a writing tool. In fact, one of her witnesses admitted to spending several hundred dollars on similar writing tools. On day 21 of the trial, Nancy took the witness stand in her own defense. In a very chatty manner, often going down what her attorney called rabbit holes, she attempted to answer the questions. Nancy described herself as an extrovert and Dan as an introvert. She stated their personalities complemented each other. In fact, she told the jury that she never met a rabbit hole she didn't like. She told the jury that when Dan died, it was like losing an arm. Despite having six insurance policies totaling over almost $1.5 million, Nancy insisted that she was better off financially if Dan had lived. On cross-examination, Nancy reluctantly admitted that if Dan had lived past 78 years old, most of that life insurance would have been reduced to just about $67,000. She had no answer to why the ghost gun kit or the slide and barrel she purchased on eBay were never found. And she stated that while she had no specific memory of driving around the crime scene, she did have a distant memory of herself sitting in an empty parking lot writing. She recalled seeing a homeless man walking back and forth near her car. And so she moved her car because she didn't want to be distracted. She explained that she did often drive around with her notebook and she would pull over when ideas came to her. She also told the jury that she didn't grieve publicly because she hates expressions of public grief. She told the jury that it was a worthless endeavor and doesn't accomplish anything positive. She said when she was alone, she was a watering pot gone astray. And she said it embarrassed her how often she cried. She insisted that just prior to Dan's murder was one of the happiest times of their lives. Perhaps she should have clarified this point a little more. On redirect, she also admitted that she believed anyone could be pushed to murder under the right circumstances. At one point in her testimony, she compared the gun parts to omelet ingredients. She said, eggs and flour don't make an omelet until you put it all together. Just like a gun kit isn't a gun until you put it all together. When she was asked why she never told the police about her ghost gun kit or the extra barrel and slide she purchased, she said she didn't want to tell police how to do their job. During closing arguments, the defense attorney Kristen Weinmiller emphasized that the jury had to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that Nancy murdered her husband. She told the jury that the prosecutor had failed to meet this high burden. Then she described to the jury how happy the Rofi marriage was based on the testimony of many of the defense witnesses. She criticized the prosecution for failing to prove a motive for Dan's murder. Apparently, she forgot about the $1.5 million worth of motive. She insisted, despite Brophy's recent loan from Dan's retirement fund, that the couple wasn't desperate for cash. She told the jury that Dan didn't want to retire and he intended to work for many more years to come. She said that Nancy, who resembles an adorable white-haired grandmother, could have divorced Dan if she was concerned with money and married one of the many wealthy men who were lined up to marry her. She told the jury the more likely scenario is a homeless man killed Dan with the intention of robbing him but left after shooting him. Then she reminded the jury that Nancy was a planner who was used to planning entire novels with intricate plot points. If she had wanted to murder her husband, she wouldn't have been seen on surveillance camera at the time of the murder. She ended her closing arguments by telling the jury that Nancy's eyes twinkled and sparkled when she talked about the love of her life. The prosecution's closing arguments were delivered by Sean Overstreet. Attorney Overstreet told the jury that Nancy's memory worked fine on a direct examination by her own attorney and only conveniently failed her on cross-examination. He asserted that her memory problems were a convenient alibi. Then he went through the surveillance videos showing Nancy circling the Culinary Institute right before and immediately following the time of the murder. He reminded the jury how odd it was that Nancy never asked the detectives how her husband died. And he told the jury how unlikely it was that Nancy would spend almost $1,600 on a gun and gun parts when she could barely keep up with her mortgage. 
He ended his closing arguments by suggesting that Nancy needed Dan's life insurance so she could retire to Portugal and travel. Nancy didn't have any living family tying her to Oregon. He said Dan was never going to agree to retire to a foreign country away from his parents, his son, or his grandchildren. And so, the jury found Nancy guilty of murdering her husband, Dan Brophy. At sentencing, the presiding judge sentenced Nancy to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 25 years. That would make Nancy eligible for release on her 94th birthday. Dan Brophy's mother and son both gave written victim impact statements. Dan's mother said that Nancy had taken a part of her family she would never get back, and she hoped Nancy would find God's grace. Dan's son Nathaniel gave the final victim impact statement. He told the court that his father was Nancy's biggest supporter, all while she was callously plotting to kill him, just like she did in her meaningless novels. On January 14th, a Lifetime movie was released entitled How to Murder Your Husband, starring Cybill Shepard as Nancy Brophy and Steve Guttenberg as Dan Brophy. It will also be streaming on Hulu. We want to send a special thank you to those that support us through Patreon. Thanks so much for being a part of Crime Salad. This week, we want to welcome our new supporters. We have Tracy Witt and Mackenzie. Thank you all so much. Enjoy the ad free listens and bonus content. And as always, for all of you, thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening to make sure you don't miss an episode. If you're really liking the show, please help support us by giving us a helpful review. It really helps us. And thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be with you next week.